Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Double East Talk Tech. My name is Mike. I'm Daniel Bogdanov, and we have Kenny Johnson back with us. Today we're going to talk about wide band gap semiconductors and how they're used for power electronics. So um, I went to APEC, the Applied Power and Electronics Conference, like three years ago. Oh, wow. um, I haven't been able to go the last couple of years because it's in the middle of scope month and, you know, scope month. Yeah, so right. um, that's busy. Um, but one of the things that people kept coming up and saying, hey, can you measure this like you know, 1400 volt, yeah. you know, like absurdly fast, you know, switch rate. Can, can you measure that? And we're like, well, no, that's way too high of a voltage. Um, so my understanding is they're working with wide band gap semiconductors. Yeah, yeah. You know, you, you kind of stumbled into it the same way I did was uh, well, not necessarily at APEC, but uh, going around and talking to our users and everything about, uh, you know, hey, so what are your problems? How can we help you? And uh, kept getting questions like, well, you know, I need something that can measure like uh, from zero to a KV at like a gigahertz bandwidth. And right. I thought, what the heck is that? <laughs> right. I mean, like <laughs> lightning. I mean, what are you doing? You know? <laughs> and uh, and so, you know, you hear one guy ask about it. and It's like, OK, well, this is some high energy physics guy right. or something. But but more and more people are asking about this. And it's yeah. like, so what is this? And they're like, oh, it's wide band gap semiconductors. And I'm like. Okay, tell me more. So yeah. give us like a you know thirty second to thirty minute overview of <laughs> yeah 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna put yeah. my uh, mic on mute. We'll just let you go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you guys know me too well. Um, bit of a talker. You know, my my wife and kids they've got um, a bit of sign language, and okay. so uh, th- that they use on me. I gotta tell you this story. I know so, a couple gestures, but I wouldn't necessarily call them sign language. Yeah, okay. It's, it's kind of <laughs> like that. Um, but basically, uh, I was, uh, I think I was at a store one time and the clerk was very, very helpful and very, very talkative and, uh, almost to the point of being bothersome. And so, uh, after I got done with that guy, I told my wife, I said, that guy was like a booger on your finger. You just couldn't get rid of. I mean, he just <laughs> kept talking and talking and she's like, now you know what it feels like. And so whenever I'm like talking to somebody <laughs> and she thinks that I'm like running over, she'll go stand behind the other person and makes that like little thing. Like she's flicking a booger off her <laughs> finger. So, you know, so she can tell me, hon, you're being a booger. It's Aww. like, yeah, okay. Well, I have to say that I, I'm beautiful. excited to finally have you on the podcast because I could just listen to you tell stories like that <laughs> for hours. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, having, having, having all the kids, we could tell some great stories. We might have to start a whole different podcast and everything. And, you know, the uh, not safe. Kenny's work analogies. That's what I like to see a yeah, three-minute podcast yeah. of. Um, nice little intro. And Kenny walks in with a Mr. Rogers sweater and is like, uh, today we're going to talk about beep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, gosh. Whew, that could be fun, actually. We might, we might have to try that on the side. All right. Let us know in the comments. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like one thing we never really talk about is the ourselves. So if you care at all, I guess, let us know. <laughs> no one cares. No one anyway, <laughs> carry on. Sorry. Why Van Gap? Yeah. yeah, well, so, you know, I started asking these guys about this, and, and uh, some of the helpful stuff came from, um, I was actually talking to, uh, this was at some uh, universities where they were doing their research okay. and everything. And so they started explaining to me, they say, well, what it is is these wide, ba- wide band gap semiconductors um, – specifically uh, gallium nitride and silicon carbide, they've got some great features to them. Um, the most prominent one is that they can turn on and off much, much faster than traditional silicon-based power semiconductors. Um, they also um, have uh, better thermal conductivity. They also re- – So they don't heat up as much. Right. They, or, or, they dish it out to, exact, to heat sinks. Exactly. It's a, exactly. So you can put smaller heat sinks or smaller fans or something like that on it. Um, so uh, with that higher switching speed, they're um, more efficient. They also it, there's uh, this uh, characteristic that's uh, um, called R on. So when when you think about it, like with a typical switching power supply, you know, kind of toggles back and forth, voltage current, voltage current, and uh, ideally when you're in the mode where, well, we're voltage, well, the current would be zero. Or it's like, well, we're shoving out some current, the voltage would be zero. Well, it's not really zero, right? And so, and the way they measure that is they call it R on. And so the, the, during that phase, then the semiconductors have much, uh, much lower uh, resistance then. So there's less loss Ideally there. zero. It's like, yeah. the, it's a drain source resistance. Is that correct? I think so. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. And um, the, uh, and the, but the other thing too is that so then when you think about like the switching is that's the time when both you know neither neither quantity voltage nor current are actually zero they're they're actually a a, a number there right and yeah. you start multiplying and so if you can make those switch faster and faster well, that's that's more efficiency that makes sense and uh, 
And if there's a slew rate associated with it, the faster it is, the less it can. Switching loss. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's a switching loss. And so um, anyways, uh, and so this, uh, this first professor I was talking to, he's showing me, um, this is actually over in uh, Denmark of all places, but uh, he was showing me a, um, they're working on um, like a, a part for a substation. And you know, like those huge transformers we have out, out back of the building. So he's showing me like, here's the existing transformer. It looked like my refrigerator at home is about that big. And he's they're like, big. and he says, if we do that same transformer, here's the same transformer in uh, wide band gap semiconductors, and it was about the size of a lunchbox. Oh. And I was like, oh my goodness. Wow. And uh, I was sounds, about to ask, what are the downsides? Because everything so far sounds like it should have been implemented whenever it was discovered. You come near they're, you just, die. they're just massive <laughs> still. Is that why? Or? Um, well, it's, it's like about everything else. When, you first, when it first comes out, it's very expensive. And so, for example, if, um, if you think about like a lot of things out there, I, I might use our scopes as an example, we could go purchase a power supply that is based on wide band gap semiconductors. Okay. So our power, that would make our scope more energy efficient, but those parts are more expensive. Does the consumer value that energy efficiency in something like an oscilloscope yet? You know, can we charge a premium to recover for that? Eh, maybe, maybe not. Probably so, not what it's worth. Like yeah, not yeah, what it would cost us. Exactly. Pay, and sure. so it's at that early phase right now and everything to where just like everything else, you know, once you get a, the economies of scale, the price comes down, everybody will adopt it. Um, part of the problem though of, uh, of the adoption is those very, very fast edge speeds. So like we were saying, well, mm -hmm. when people are saying, I need a gigahertz, you're like a gigahertz. Well, they're just using that old, um, <clears throat> Bandwidth times rise time equals 0.35 kind of thing and saying, well, this is the rise time on those things. I mean, they got a crazy slew rate, so I need, mm -hmm. a, need a gigahertz. Well, if you start s switching things that fast on your board, you have terrible EMI and RFI problems. And so mm -hmm. it's a matter of how you're going to package these things in such a way that you can um, not have these EMC, you know, you know and, and uh, RFI problems. That makes sense. Um, the other thing is that they are very um, – um, because they're switching so fast is that they can't handle much um, inductance in their uh, – Sure. Right? Yeah. And so uh, – Because so the inductive, inductance is going to like not let you change basically. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Yeah. There's Just, a video on our YouTube channel about that. Yeah. Just there you go. Shameless plug. Yeah. <laughs> it's called debugging parasitic inductance. So. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, <laughs> go, I'll go watch it. Got to go. Yeah. <laughs> make make sure a, I don't say anything. Put a plug in, in, in there. Make no, sure you're good. That was all. Yeah. So the um, – <laughs> Uh, so the thing there is they can't, is you can't have much, uh, much, much inductance in the circuit and everything. And so, um, it isn't, so they don't necessarily lend themselves to the existing packaging. Um, plus it's also still early enough that, um, in fact, like, uh, a lot of the standards committees like uh, JDEC, I think is just now starting to, uh, come up with some standards about how you would specify performance and how you would measure it. So you can compare apples to apples when you're looking across things. So okay. talking to a couple of the guys from the JDEC committee and everything, it sounds like we're today with wide band gap semiconductors, we're at the point that like uh, uh, traditional uh, silicon semiconductors were back in their beginning and everything to where some of them exist, but how do you know which one's good? And there isn't really any packaging standards yet or common footprints. And so, um, so it's one of those things of kind of like wait and see, but the mind boggling part about this <coughs> is um, that uh, the size and the energy efficiency and, um, like I said, that, that professor I was talking to, um, he was working on utilities and the wide band gap semiconductors then, that's sort of the gateway to the smart grid. Um, hmm. You know, the, the feature there is that be, um, one, of the th one of the features there beyond the energy efficiency is when you think about smart grid, at least as I understand it, is we start breaking things down into smaller and smaller pieces to where we're turning things off when they're not being used. Right. Rather than keeping th everything energized all the time, we're turning it off. We can turn it on in a heartbeat, turn it off in a heartbeat. Like the wall itself even. Yeah. yeah. Um, just, so just like your, uh, your, your phone, for example, right? You know, if I'm not using you, go to sleep. Well, they want to go even better than go to sleep. It's like, I'm just cutting you off. You get no power. And, um, and so uh, um, I think the first place we'll see, where we'll probably see these showing up uh, might not be utilities, but probably is more in um, supplies for server farms. Oh, okay. You know, um, in talking to these folks, the single biggest cost of running a server farm, it ain't the people, it ain't the building, and it isn't the servers, it's the utilities. Oftentimes right. the locations of server farms is based on utility prices, and there's a lot of negotiation with right. local utilities to yeah. – 
Yeah. Yeah. By far and away the highest expense. Oh my gosh. It's crazy to think about how much. So what it's, it's a pretty significant percentage of the entire U S's power grid goes towards just powering servers. Well, let me, I don't know what the number is, but it's big. Well, let me put this in perspective. I read a, uh, an article. Now this was seven years ago. This was like uh, printed in 2010. I think it was, and it was a, a New York times, uh, um, article, and they were trying to estimate um, how much power Google consumes. Oh. And so they kind of estimated at that point in time that uh, Google used oh, two, Google what? used 2.3 <laughs> terawatt hours of electricity. Ooh. Now, to put that in perspective, um, there is a power plant in the center of Colorado Springs that the highway has to wrap around, and it creates traffic nightmares all the time because that curve the of the road. And that power plant is not big enough to supply that much power. Hmm. And uh, um, they also estimated that at that point in time, again, this was a long time ago before cloud had taken off, but that uh, there was about 900,000 servers um, that Google was running. Now, here's the shocking point. That was about 1% of the world's servers. Hmm. Okay. Google's only 1% of the world's servers? Yeah, with 900,000 servers and 2.3 terawatt hours of electricity, and that was only hmm. 1% of the servers in the world. Interesting. And I was like, oh, my goodness. So, you know, things have changed a bit since then, I'm sure. In other know, news, Google has 1% of the world's servers. <laughs> I bet they do, <laughs> and, probably, and probably Facebook. And right, I mean, CIA like, and or Cisco. And all that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so you can see how fast it ramps up. And so I think that's where we'll start seeing this stuff first is for um, – because um, – they're willing to pay for the the expertise, the development. You know, these companies have the pockets then to go through and work on the packaging mm -hmm. and things like that. But uh, it's just fascinating. You know, another um, – uh, I think we shared this in, in uh, one of the other blurbs while we were talking was just a bit about how the U.S. Department of Energy thinks that this is such a big, important deal that they want guys like you and me to go back and get a degree in power electronics. Right. And uh, they'll pay – uh, I can't remember how much the stipend was, whether it's like, you know, a full fellowship or just cover tuition kind of stuff. But uh, and they also think that it's vitally important. Um, every country, in fact, probably thinks this is to have a, uh, a solid manufacturing base for that and everything because it, it is sense. the future of power because of this efficiency. Well, and, and like diplomatically, if you control the fabrication of silicon or germanium, what was it? Gallium nitride, gallium, gallium nitride. silicon yeah. carbide. Yeah. Then, like, if you control the source of, of, you know, those fabs, then you basically control. You literally have power over the world, right? Exactly. And so, um, and you think about it too. These are also um, because of their small size and their efficiency. Well, gosh, that's great for like hybrid electric vehicles or all electric mm -hmm. vehicles and everything. So it's it's one of the enabling technologies for the efficiency of that. It's also um, very, very important for like um, uh, the alternative energy sources like uh, wind and solar for all those uh, uh, inverters for getting the power onto the grid and everything. I imagine you could also deliver power faster because you're, if you're working at a kilovolt, right, like – being able to instead of having to up convert it from mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. wall or something at a you know 110 volts or 220, like you could just you know charge a vehicle in, in a snap without. Oh, I that's conjecture. I, I, yeah, I, I don't know how much of that with the with the with charging <laughs> the, the batteries is is limits to existing batteries or how yeah, how big a hose you can Safety. you can pile in there. But part of it too is um, you know if these things can turn on and off faster and switch faster, you can control them faster. They can respond to loads faster and everything. And so ah. all of that then just means you have to have less excess capacity. You can more supply demand on demand rather than have have to have extra extra capacity sitting around someplace. That makes sense. And uh, just a just a couple of things off this uh, this little infographic uh, from uh, the U.S. Department of Energy. So they say that if uh, industrial motor systems, so this is the variable frequency drives for like pumps and things like that, um, you know, for you know shoving around the natural gas or mm -hmm. you know the the water in our our pipes and all that kind of stuff, if uh, if those um, uh, motor control drives were wide band gap semiconductor saves enough for a million homes. If the wall warts that we use for our uh, PCs, our smartphones, stuff like that, if we change those over, that's 1.3 million homes. And if uh, the inverters for uh, wind farms, that's 700,000 homes. And so that's nothing more than just changing wow. over to something, hmm. you know, just, just getting on to the, the new product or the, the new technology. Do you remember a couple of years back, we brought in someone who was, you know, a pretty strong scope user who worked for a company that developed pumps? 
and electric motors. Yes, yes. And the stat he brought up, I don't remember the specifics, but it was something like 20 plus percent. I think it was higher than this, but I want to be conservative. It was like 20% of the, the world's power is consumed by motors. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it was upwards of like 40% of the world's power, but I, yes, yes. So, easily uh, double digits. So I, I, I won't mention the, the, the company's name, but, but they are. They're out of Denmark, and they're the, uh, the biggest pump manufacturer over there in Denmark. And uh, they were actually – because of that, pretty, pretty um, important for them. I yeah, exa- exactly. <laughs> yeah. You know, they're they're kind of on the leading edge with you know wind and things like that, and renewable energy. But of course, because um, pumps are such a huge consumer of power, and and that just huge. blew me away until I started thinking about it. Like last uh, over the weekend when I was coming back from uh, from Candy Nearing out in Utah, and I'm driving across uh, um, Eastern Utah and, and uh, Western Colorado is all that natural gas mm-hmm. out there. Well, you know, you get that out of the ground, you got to pressurize it, you got to shove it someplace. How about that water when we turn on the faucet? And that's just that's just for our utilities and everything. Yeah. And then when you think about all the uh, the industrial for like, oh, we're going to go make, you know, chemicals or paints or whatever else, it's just mind-boggling. Well, we always complain about how cold this room is. You know, you walk into the room, we film it, and it's like, oh, it's cold. You know, there's an air conditioner running. The air mm-hmm. conditioner is based off of a compressor. And a right. compressor is, you know, at its... Push, break it down. It's, it's, a, it's a pump. It's an air pump. There, there is a whole. In fact, uh, one of our uh, my wife and I have three sons. The oldest son works for a company that goes around and helps companies um, or customers for them. But uh, you know, school districts, libraries, companies like us um, recover energy costs by. Um, uh, by things just like that, where sometimes it's smart stuff like, uh, okay, you know, um, we're going to go ahead and we're going to go out and look at the forecast tomorrow. If it's going to be hot, we're going to pre-chill everything with cold air tonight, oh, things like that. But the future then is going towards these Whoa. these compressors and pumps because these things, for example, are, are you know they're moving cooling mm-hmm. water and things like that around, going to these wide band gap semiconductors in these in these uh, motor controllers and everything. And uh, it's it's the future. And the reason I um, I was excited about it because uh, it seems like uh, that's the next place where we can help a lot of people do the things they need to have done. They're looking for some really exotic tools to measure these things. There really aren't some good ones yet. They're starting to show up, by the way. They're starting they're starting to show up, but uh, it's an opportunity to be helpful. And you know, myself, um, I like to uh, I like to learn, and uh, it's kind of like. Uh, if, if my brain is like the balloon of knowledge, if, if the balloon continues to expand, I feel enriched. If it quits expanding, I get kind of bored. And so I was really excited when this starts coming up and everything because it's a place to go uh, learn about something it's new and yeah. help people in industries that we normally don't help. You know, myself working here, you know, I'm not usually not working with guys that are doing uh, solar farm inverters or electric vehicles right. and stuff like that. It's more that, you know, the servers and the smartphones and stuff like that. So it's really, it's really pretty cool. And, um, it's, uh, it's something that uh, there's jobs there, and it's going to drive the economy when it starts to go because it'll start turning over the, the utility grid and uh, so much more. Awesome. So I, I would ask our, our listeners and watchers, if, if any of you guys are power engineers and you have some thoughts on this, please let us know. We'd love to, to read your comments about it. Um, I think one of the things that, that uh, when I was at APEC and did a little more digging into it, it turned out that a lot of the people, at least three years ago, that were looking at this were actually on the power generation side of things. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. and it makes sense, right? If you can increase the efficiency of your power plant, you're going to make more money because you can deliver more power to paying customers or to whoever you're you know, delivering power to. So, yeah, you know, and I think the um, <laughs> some of the places that, that, uh, um, you probably see it start showing up first. It's going to be some of the uh, the large metropolitan areas, you know, L.A., New York, stuff like that. Where sure. I think, like right here in uh, Colorado, uh, you know, if you're a if you're a um, a corporation, you're probably negotiating a utility rate that's about something like four cents a kilowatt hour with utilities. Out mm-hmm. in L.A., it's probably something like around like eighteen cents a kilowatt hour. And so uh, there's a lot of money to be made or saved there. If that's your motivation or, you know, if you're just trying to, you know, have a, you know, be nicer to the planet and everything, there's, there's a lot of opportunity there. And then for, for things like, uh, you know, whether it's, um, uh, you know, this, the size and the form factor of our products, just the fact that these things can be so much smaller, that's mm-hmm. nice. You know, I small, you know, more stuff in a smaller space. So if you're that, if you're that server farm and everything, maybe what that means is you don't have to change out anything in the server farm. And all of a sudden you can have a lot more computing power in that same size building with that same cooling capacity. And, and so, you know, that's it. And with the explosion of the cloud, boy, I tell you, that's, that's where yeah. it's going to be. So I think utilities and servers is where we're going to see that stuff showing up first. Interesting. 
we'll have to keep an eye out for it. Yeah, yeah. You know, and as I learn more, I'll, I'll share with you guys. But uh, that's yeah. it, it was just my my, my new nerd thing. I was like, oh, this is cool. Something to go learn about, right? It's cool so stuff. I, so I wanted yeah. to learn more about it. Yeah, it's really cool you, that you mentioned this because now that I'm the more I'm thinking about it, you're talking about how motors and pumps take up most of the power yeah. on the planet. Uh, if you think about it, if you think about any form of work or any form of energy delivery, it's all just about moving stuff around. Whether it's a refrigerator moving heat in and out, or a, a light bulb pushing electrons around, or oh, a yeah. pump moving air or water around. Um, <laughs> so it sounds like there's probably a lot of applications for this that are probably not as obvious as as what we've been talking about already. So it'll be cool to see where it goes. What do you, what do you think the uh, the life cycle is for this? When are we going to start seeing it uh, implemented? Gosh, that's a great question. You know, I, I knew that for a while there. So I was digging into this really heavy up until about six months ago and had to had to move off to something else. But uh, I think we're probably in about the, like right now, some of those big name companies out there that you think of for like power semiconductors, um, you can, they've got parts right now today. And uh, I think it's going to start really, um, I think you'll probably start seeing it in the next two to five years, it's going to be, you know, competing with traditional power semiconductors. And um, so a lot more mainstream, you know, the challenge really right now, what I what I get the biggest, the biggest roadblock right now is that that Mm -hmm. efficiency is due to how fast you can switch those things. But if you really start switching that fast, you just have a radiation nightmare, right? Your, Mm. your, you know, your RFI noise is just a super problem. And so trying to, and so what do guys do? It's like, Oh, let's turn it down. So it's not switching as fast. Well, there went your efficiency. Right. And that from talking to people, I think is the biggest problem they got right now. And so as soon as somebody kind of figures out the way to package that and do that and really be successful, it's just going to blossom everywhere. I have a question. So is the noise, you know, the radiation, and I assume it's both, but is it how fast, some, it's not necessarily the speed of the edge, but the fact that they're doing it like repeatedly over and over and over. So if you like, you know, switched fast, but had a slower frequency, and then you're just like in your supplies, you're using a better charge storage system than so isn't that like left hand rule electromagnetic kind of stuff what are we getting into or well well you know so just just uh going where uh because the fast edge has those frequency components right exactly but the power is not of that emission is you know if um uh so the fast edge is what uh causes the problem many many sequential fast edges builds up to it's okay. additive and adds the problem and so with um when you go look at like the um the requirements for like you know having your having your part like for us to pass our rfi certification we can have emission levels at a certain up to a certain level is acceptable and so what they do is that's where you start seeing things like this uh spread spectrum clocking kind sure. of thing. so you're varying the frequency uh, okay. so you're making the noise but Smearing it's it. exactly exactly and so it? that's and uh um, and so with these things, the major source of the noise is it's that lightning strike. Call it's it that adjacent fast p- channel power instead. Now, does like lowering <laughs> the voltage of it, like if it has like the same slew rate, but it's five volts instead of 500, does that reduce EMI or because we're talking about this being 1400 volts? What if they, if they dial that back with that? Like if your edge is taller, <laughs> does it have more power? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming it does, but I don't know. Um, gosh, I don't know. You know, thinking about that, you know, the, the slew rate's the same. It's just, you know, how high a hill does it have to climb and everything? Um, yeah, I don't know. It, it, it must affect the power because if you had a negligibly small, like a, you know, maybe you're doing like a microvolt up and down, it's not going to do anything. But if you're doing... Yeah, like like going back to good old calculus. Let's take test take it the to limits the infinity of, of and take zero it to zero. And yeah. It's like you know, if it's really tiny, it's not doing anything. A lightning strike in the backyard makes a hell of a lot of a yeah. lot of uh, you know electromagnetic interference. So it all adds up though, right? Okay. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. That's a good question. All right, stupid question time. Mm. What's the widest band gap, and why? <laughs> and why? <laughs> mm. I see on your chart on the chart, your chart here we got diamond at the bottom. Can we expect like diamond cell phones soon or? Wow, I you know it's actually th- you know carbon, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, the widest band gap, yeah. So like uh, it, you know, you can see the same chart I'm looking at. This is a, a U.S. Department of Energy, yeah, page. We'll, we'll link it in yeah. the description. Yeah, so diamond, but uh, you know, I don't think we're too good at making. Uh, fabric- what, what's the diamond band gap? Does it does it have a five point five electron volts? And uh, gallium nitride is 3.4, silicon carbide is 3.3, and then things like typical silicon is 1.1, germanium is 0.7. Okay. And, uh, you know, probably one of the um, uh, wide band gap parts that you're familiar with the most right now, you know, some of the wide band gap semiconductors 
produce visible light. And so some oh. high-efficiency LEDs yeah. are gallium nitride parts. What do they call them? Dots. Something dots. I don't remember. I learned about it in school. I should know this. Dip anyway. And, dip and dots. Dip and dots. Yep. Light up dip and dots. Cool in the dark. Anyway, we're out of time. That was, yeah, we're right on time. So thanks again, Kenny, for coming out. It's been great having you for two episodes in a row. I'm sure we'll, <laughs> thanks, if guys. you want, uh, you know, story time with Kenny, we'll set up the fireplace. And, uh, yeah, then I'll really answer that <laughs> wide band gap uh, question. There was quite a gap this weekend. I tried to cross and didn't make it in that canyon. And I got some blunt trauma to my right butt cheek that is just amazing. And mm. so I can tell you some. <laughs> I wasn't some, sure where you're going yeah, with band yeah. gap, so I'm glad yeah, you yeah. went to the canyon thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, uh, no, I knew, I knew we had to be PG or better here. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm good. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Thanks, nope. Kenny. We haven't had to use the uh, the sensory tool yet, have we? Uh, not no. for the podcast that I'm aware of. I mean, well, maybe that one episode we had to throw away. Uh, yeah, there was one. Anyway. Well, <laughs> lost in the, the, in the lost ether. In, lost in the ether. Sorry, folks. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's all for today. Make sure you subscribe to the Keyside Oscilloscope's YouTube channel and Doubly's Talk Tech on your favorite podcast engine. Give us a review. Let us know what you think in the comments. If there's topics you want to cover, keep putting them. We like to read them. Uh, thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. Cheers. Take care, everybody. The, uh, my car gets broken into all the time, but I leave no. it outside and I leave it unlocked. But I leave nothing in my car because I'd rather have someone go through my glove box and break a window. Yeah. So it's happened like three times in the last couple months, and all they take is like a dollar worth of change out of my little tray. So I think I'm going to print a sign up, put it in my window, and says, there's nothing in my car. You should know this by now. Thank you. <laughs> well, you know, they, Thank you. Come again. They're actually very kind about it. I come oh, yeah. and I see my door like softly closed. Not like closed, but so the lights don't stay on. Oh, yeah. They went through my glove box. they don't want to like, slam it. And then, yeah, yeah, exactly. And all I have in my glove box is my user's manual and all my service records. And they were just like sitting nicely on the floor in the passenger side, glove box <laughs> closed. No lights were left on. Cur so it's like at least, at, least they're, like, at least they're nice about it. But